Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for making time joining my session. Uh, my name is Chan Sui, I'm a Senior Container Specialist Solutions Architect from AWS. Um, today I'm going to talk about Carpenter, a uh, new concept of Kubernetes cluster autoscaler, which help you simplify data, man uh, data node management. Uh, before I kick off the session, may I ask how many of you heard about Carpenter? Please raise your hand if you have heard about Carpenter. Thank you. Um, I hope this session will give you an idea of like, what Carpenter is and help you further validate Carpenter. And uh, I do speak Korean, so after the session, if you have any questions in Korean, and if you have, if you have some enough time after the session, I'm more than happy to help. I'll be here around the room. So feel free to ask any question after the session in Korean as well. Uh, here's a quick agenda for the session. I will first introduce some of Kubernetes auto-scaling features and provide some of overview of Carpenter, what challenges it solved, why it is developed it, and some of the key features of Carpenter, such as strict consolidation and disruption control that help you day to operations. Container has different scaling requirements, such as CPU and memory, depending on your workloads, depending on your traffic patterns, and that may change over time. And you need to have a place to run your containers. Um, and AWS, for example, provides different type of EC2 instances that are suitable for different workloads. And when you see the instance name, we do have different instance family, different capabilities. Like some instance families are optimized for compute, some instances are more optimized for memory, or network, or storage, and some of the instances have GPU, for example. And you need to have that flexibility to choose the instance that you need to run your container, you need to scale your containers. And in Kubernetes, uh, there are some of existing auto-scaling solutions, such as HPA, that automatically scales the number of replicas in your Kubernetes deployment. Uh, based on the target metrics you set up, you can automatically add the number of replicas or add, remove the replicas in your deployment. And VPA is a solution to help you automatically right size your pod. Based on the metrics over time, it provides you recommended you know, container size. Uh, you can use that recommendation or directly apply that um, recommendation to your pods. And Cluster Autoscaler is a solution that automatically scale the number of nodes when you have new replicas to schedule and when the new replicas cannot be scheduled on existing worker nodes. Instead of you manually adding the node, Cluster Autoscaler could, can automatically call one of autoscaling groups in your environment to add one of worker nodes to schedule your pending pods automatically. However, it comes with some of the challenges. If you have experience with autoscaling groups, and the naming convention may, different, may be different depending on what cloud provider you use. But you know, whenever you use cluster autoscaler, there could be an uh, autoscaling group. And autoscaling group is tied to one specific instance type. And the autoscaling group will represent as node group in Kubernetes environment. And in this example, we have one autoscaling group with M7G large instance. And when we have new workload that requires different resources, such as GPU workload for inference or you know, training, that may require different computing uh, resource. And because your current order scaling group is tied to one specific instance type, your existing order scaling group cannot schedule, cannot host your new workloads. So you end up adding additional order scaling group with a different compute resource. And in this example, we are adding a uh, new auto scaling group with P4, uh, you know, 24XL instance, and that is tied to that specific instance type. But at large scale, you may have more number of workloads that require different compute resource, and also to achieve high availability, you may add additional auto scaling group per AZ or across AZ. And in cloud environment, there are different purchasing options. You can either use on demand which is you, the purchasing option, you pay for what you use, or you can also use spot instance, that is basically a spare capacity, you can use with steep discount up to 90%, but the instance can be terminated, so the workflow should tolerate inter uh, any interruptions. But in order to fully leverage all the options in cloud, you need to create multiple order scaling groups. 
So Carpenter it removed the concept of node group or autoscaling group. There's no concept of autoscaling group at all. When there are the paths that cannot be scheduled in existing capacity, uh, Carpenter look at the path definition and choose the best instance that can host your, your paths automatically instead of you creating all different order scaling groups. And recently, Carpenter is, um, was accepted to CNCF Kubernetes SIG order scaling group. So it's basically open source. You're not locked into like one environment versus other. And instead of creating multiple order scaling groups, you can have a very simple configuration to control what instance type you want to give and like what, what availability zone or what different compute requirements you like to use when you provision worker needs. So previously, when there are pending paths, cluster autoscaler talk to autoscaling group, and then it creates EC2 instance, for example, in AWS environment. But Carpenter, because there's no autoscaling group, it directly calls EC2 fleet API to uh, provision the worker nodes based on the pending paths that cannot be scheduled into your existing capacity. And this is based on two constructs, two CRDs called node pool and EC2 node class. Node pool is a construct where you define your compute requirements. Instead of having like one instance type, you know, you can have multiple different instance family, and you can also control the size of instance. In this example, I'm controlling, I want to have the worker nodes which have more than four free CPU. So the smaller instances will not be selected from your test. In Kubernetes, depending on the number of demo sets you have, and also because Kubelet requires some of resource, uh, it's in general recommended not to use two small instances. And you can also control a certain availability zone to use in cloud environment. And you can control the total amount of limits on CPU and memory that you like to allocate to certain level. And also you have a flexibility with the compute, like flex, um, compute architecture, CPU architecture. And you can also have the flexibility with the purchasing option, either on demand or spot. And when both spot and on-demand are present in node pool, spot will be automatically productized when spot, is, spot capacity is available. But if spot is not available, on-demand will be automatically picked up. The next question you may have is, then how do I control like where to schedule my pods? How do I control like how to spread my pods? Uh, even Carpenter can help you pick up the nodes. You may still want to control, I want to control, I want to deploy this container to certain MC. I want to control, you know, scheduling certain paths to a certain instance type. Um, you can still use all those Kubernetes native scheduling constraints such as node selector, you know, take and tolerations, node affinity, and topology spread constraint. And I do have some examples and this is based on the labels that will be automatically added by Carpenter on the nodes that are finally deployed. Uh, so Carpenter adds a lot of labels, and you can use those labels to control how to schedule your ads. Uh, for example, in this node pool, we have both spot and on-demand uh, given here, but you want to have you want to deploy your workloads to only spot instance. Uh, I said, you know. If spot and both on demand are both there, spot will, will be productized, but there is no guarantee on demand is not selected. So if you want to have that kind of control, in this example I'm using node affinity, we require during uh, scheduling. That means if the worker node doesn't have the specific label, the pod will not be scheduled. That's the condition that pod can be scheduled. Uh, the build should have the certain label on it. And, um, when the pod is, you know, when the pod is pending, the Kubernetes scheduler will try to first schedule the pod to a worker node that has this label. But if there's no worker node available, then Carpenter will use the node pool described it here and then create the spot instance with that label if spot is available and then schedule the pod. So if spot is not available, the, the pod will not be scheduled at all. And this is also a very common requirement to spread your pod across multiple availability zones. Uh, even we specify multiple AZ in Notebook. I give US West 2A, US West 2B, 
But still, from a Kubernetes perspective, there's no way to guarantee spreading your pod across multiple availability zones. Unless you use the topology spread constraint with the zone as a key to spread your number of uh, replicas in your Kubernetes deployment. So in this example, I'm allowing one max queue, and then using the, the label, one of labels that identify the, the availability zone, which will be added to your work in a provision by Carpenter Notable, and then, and then spread the paths. So if I have six replicas in the deployment, three replicas will be evenly distributed. If I have seven replicas, you may have four in one AZ, three in one AZ, because there's a max, one max queue that I'm allowing. Or you can use simple node selector. But with the custom label on your worker node, you can easily add any custom label or custom annotation on the node pool. That means you can have multiple node pools instead of one node pool and then use the label to isolate your, your worker nodes, isolate your node pool. I'm using team A, so maybe you have different workloads in the same cluster that you like to isolate by workloads, you know, workloads or nodes, uh, then you can use this custom label. And many customers that I met, they start with a single large node pool to so host all the workloads, but uh, there might be the use case, there might be use cases to isolate for multi-tenant environment. Uh, and the multi-tenant in this context is the node level multi-tenant, not the cluster level item, uh, multi-tenant. So if you have multiple tenants, you like to isolate from the node level uh, in the same cluster, you need to have multiple node, uh, multiple node pools. And that is to, there might be different use cases, but there might be to isolate two expensive like uh, hardwares, like CPU instances, or you know the instances for a tra tra uh, training or inference, and maybe your security team enforced you to isolate the workloads by the no different nodes. And in order to use different OS and subnets, uh, you need to have multiple node pools because the node pool is mapped to one node class, easy to node class, and easy to node class is where you define your OS type and subnets and user data. If you are familiar with AWS, AWS provides something called launch template where you define your OS and user data. And you, that's similar to EC2 node class. Uh, so when you use node pool, because you are using one node class, you can only use one OS types per each node pool. And when you have multiple node pools, you can also set up the priority uh, on the worker node. Uh, that's the use case when you have pre-purchase like pre-committed instance types uh, that you like to consume first, then you can have multiple node pools with different priority, and higher weight has a higher priority. Uh, with the limit value set up on each node pool, so you can make sure you are first consuming a certain instance type if you have any commitment-based usage that are limited to a certain instance type. And as I mentioned, the node pool is using one node class, and node class uh, is where you define OS and subnets and user data and more like security groups and more information like volume, volume information as well. Um, and, and in this example, the AL2 here and actually AMI means Amazon Machine Image that is just the OS that is used for EC2 instance. And in here, AL2 means Amazon EKS Optimized Linux 2 instance and I'm using the latest tag, that means Carpenter will always try to use the latest AMI image for Amazon Linux 2 optimized uh, AMI image. And, and you can use that to upgrade your worker nodes. And before that, I wanted to briefly uh, explain what Drift is. Uh, Drift is to manage uh, you know, the handle changes to your node pool and EC2 node class. You may have workloads, you know, the worker nodes already provisioned by node pool and node class, but, but in the future, you may want to change, you, your requirements may change. So if you make a change in your node pool or node class, the change will be automatically applied. Uh, it's similar to Kubernetes deployment. When you change the value in Kubernetes deployment and apply the change, your existing resource will be drifted and then we uh, redeployed it, right? Um, so when you make a change in your node pool, uh, Carpenter will detect the change and say, 
uh, this resource is drifted from your desired value and then apply that drift to, um, to, to make sure the desired value is applied. And you can use this as an upgrade mechanism to make sure your worker nodes are up to date. Um, again, I'm using AL2 with latest you know, tag on it. So it's trying to, it will try to use always the latest AMI uh, matched to your Kubernetes API server version. So if you upgrade your Kubernetes control plane, such as API server, then it will automatically, de automatically detect your existing worker nodes are outdated because your current uh, worker nodes are 1.29, but you are upgrading the control plane to 1.30, that means your AMI versions are outdated now. It will automatically detect the change and apply the upgrades to your existing worker nodes. Um, but in, in, in reality, it could be very risky operation depending on how you handle disruptions. You may want to control when to upgrade your worker nodes instead of automatically upgrading worker nodes along with your control plan. Uh, in, the, in that case, you can use a specific tag on it. You can see the specific version pin on the AMI selected term. If you have the specific the, the version there, even you upgrade your control plan, the worker nodes will not be drifted. You can control when to uh, upgrade your worker nodes by changing the, the tag there manually. And the next topic is consolidation. Uh, you can enable consolidation in the node pool. Uh, then Carpenter will actively look at the opportunity to right size and consolidate underutilized or empty worker nodes. And by doing that in this example, it it, it automatically moves those underutilized the work the the path from the underutilized worker nodes to other other worker nodes. But you may want to control when the consolidation happens to prevent Carpenter from you know keeping disrupting your nodes. So you can set up consolidate after value like one hour, then the consolidation will happen after an hour from the last event. And also, one of common questions I got is, uh, what's the what's the algorithm? What's the mechanism to choose which worker node to consolidate when you have multiple, like thousands of worker nodes? How do we know and how do we control which worker nodes will be terminated, will be consolidated? Uh, there are some of the the mechanisms here. Uh, in this example, actually, all the worker nodes can be consolidated, even the worker node that have three pods. The three pods can be all all moved to other worker nodes. However, uh, Carpenter will pick up the node that has less number of paths to minimize the disruption. So the node that has three paths will not be terminated. The rest of the worker nodes could be the candidate to be terminated and move to other worker nodes. And um, it prefer older worker nodes when all the conditions are the same uh, to make sure like new nodes are like being refreshed every time. And N to zero means it's consolidating multiple nodes to zero nodes, but N to one consolidation means it can also consolidate multiple nodes to one smaller, cheaper instance. Uh, so in this example, it can also consolidate those underutilized, under allocated worker nodes to more cost-effective worker nodes. And next question, you may have is how to control further disruptions. Uh, I want to control when my worker nodes will be up upgraded, like in which time, or like how many worker nodes I'd like to uh, up upgrade or consolidate at once. Uh, for that, you need to understand some of the disruption types. There are involuntary disruptions and also voluntary disruption. Involuntary disruption is something you cannot control, like spot termination, it will give you two minutes you know, termination notification, but you cannot stop the node being terminated. And also, like if there's a problem on the OS, or if you hard kill the node, then any of the disruption controls you have on your worker nodes will not be honored. Uh, but Carpenter has a built-in termination handler that will at least try to uh, evacuate those pods by draining those pods. And before terminating the nodes, it will try to launch the replacement first and then drain the nodes, and then terminate the worker nodes, if time is allowed. Like Spot, for example, has two minutes, so it, it has built-in uh, termination handler you can enable from the Carpenter deployment. 
And the, dis the other disruption, the voluntary disruption, is something you can control the disruptions, uh, such as expiration, or consolidation, or drift. You can have a control to make sure certain worker nodes or certain parts are not terminated from those disruption events. So you may be familiar with pot disruption budgets, which is to use to uh, keep certain number of replicas always running. So if you have if you have like five replicas, I want to make sure at least two replicas are always running. You can have PDB set up as two, then if that PDB is not honored, a certain worker node will not be terminated if that term, if that violates your PDB. And Carpenter can also have the node level budget to control how many nodes to terminate at once. And you can explicitly add the annotation on the node or pod. So if you have like long running workloads or if you have workloads that you don't want to be disrupted from those consolidation events, you can just add those annotation on the pod on the node. Then the node or pod will not be terminated from those events. And this is node pool disruption budget which is added from 0 0.34 version. Uh, you can control, uh, again, how many nodes can be terminated at a certain time window. Um, in this example, there's, I'm setting up node disruption from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. for Monday to Friday. Um, and you're allowing 20% disruption after 5 p.m. for the rest of 16 hours. And from Carpenter version 1, we recently uh, GA, officially GA Carpenter as a version 1, and which comes with some of uh, additional capabilities to have the fine grained controls on the disruptions. Uh, not only you can set up the disruption budget, but you can also control the di disruption by each different reason. In this example, I'm setting up, I don't want any of my worker nodes to be terminated, to be disrupted, from underutilized event or drift. So the consolidation event or drift will not happen during that time window. But still, I want the, work, the empty worker node to be terminated. And you have another rule here setting up, I'm still allowing all the worker, all the empty worker nodes can be terminated while the, the, you know, the drift and consolidation nodes are not uh, destructed. And you can also set up, uh, like I want to allow 10% of nodes can be terminated from underutilized or drifted events. And those events, you can use multiple roles together. That means the first, the role will be still honored. So like from your working hour, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., any of the worker nodes will not be terminated for consolidation and drift event, but allowing 100% uh, consolidation for the empty worker nodes. While you have 10% nodes you're allowing uh, disrupting for drift and consolidation outside of your work, uh, business hour. And this was also very commonly, very, very highly requested feature from our customers um, and from the community as well. Um, when you have expired after, you may have internal policy to refresh your AMI every 30 days, for example. And in that case, when you have PDB or when you have any of the disruption controls that I mentioned in your worker nodes, that worker node will not be terminated. And at large scale, when you have multiple teams and you as a platform engineer, for example, or SRE, it's very, very hard to track those changes. Like if you have PDB across the board, when you upgrade your data plans, you, you, you will have those outliers every time. And sometimes you need to make a decision doing the force upgrade, doing you know the force rolling out to the certain version, giving and giving them, giving the team with some of the notification. So we come. Uh, so the carpenter adds a feature called termination grace period. So if you set this up after that time, uh, after this grace period, the nodes will be auto. Uh, it will be force uh, deployed. So whatever disruption control you have. You know, it will change as an involuntary disruptions, and then those will be uh, disrupted. And here's some of the summaries. Um, Carpenter simplifies node management. It not only automatically scales your data plan, but it helps consolidation strict for upgrade and disruption controls for data operations. And you can have multiple node pools instead of one for any multi-tenant environment to have node level isolation. 
And Drift help you apply changes such as upgrade. We can have consolidation for cost optimization and also fine grain control. And it's open source basically. So we're uh, looking forward to have the collaboration from the community. We have very active online community in Slack um, and GitHub. So please join us. And uh, thank you for uh, listening to my session. Thanks so much for attending.